Then welcome and good morning to our Wednesday morning Life Light Bible study on the Gospel of Matthew. And as always, we start with an opening worship. And this time around, uh, if all goes well, we're going to uh, be led by a, a video that has our uh, opening worship song on it. So let's see if Pastor can make this a reality. Here's the word. Hark the glad sound, the Savior comes, the Savior promised. job with those. Okay, we'll go back to our uh, opening worship sheet and we'll continue on with the intro. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Save, Save us, us, we pray. pray. Oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord is God, God and, and he has made his light, light to shine upon us. Bind the vessel of sacrifice with cords, up to the horns of the Lord. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As, as it was in the beginning, beginning is yes. now, and will be forever. Amen. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have many things to bring before your attention this morning, things that are bothering us and troubling us and things that we are worried about. And we ask that you would take that worry from us and that concern from us so we can focus on your word and what you have to teach us this morning. And we also have things, Lord, we want to give thanks to you for. We want you to be with Dallas this morning, Lord. Bring healing, comfort, and strength to him as he is in the hospital. May his surgery go without complications. And as soon as he is healed, Lord, release him from the hospital. Protect him from catching anything else such as COVID or any other things that he might get in. Just watch over him, Lord. We have your promise that you are with him and watching over him. And be with uh, Norma as she is at home and can't be there and is worried. Uh, grant her that peace that goes beyond everything that happens in our lives. Heavenly Father, on behalf of our brother John, we give thanks that uh, he has uh, gotten a new job. And we ask that you would be with him as he performs that job. And he would be a good witness, uh, being a hard worker for his boss, but also being a witness to Christ in the place that you have placed him. Be with Dave Kelly as he is in intensive care and on a ventilator because of COVID. Be with all those around us that we know in our lives who have contracted COVID, including Pastor Meckes and a member at Journey Lutheran Church, 
uh, with my ex-brother-in-law, Dan, and with my daughter, Virginia, as she continues to heal at home. Bring complete healing to all of these, Lord, and, and keep them patient as they are healed. And may they turn and trust solely in you and see the means of doctors and medicine as coming as a gift from your hands. Be with our sister Sharon, Lord. Prevent, provide her with health and healing that she needs. And we ask that you would uh, keep her well enough this day that she can continue and uh, be with us here in Bible study. Lord, be with all the unrest that's going on in our country. We ask that you would be a calming influence among all. Bring wisdom and discernment for law enforcement and for the public who it's right, Lord, to protest, but not the way they're doing it. Uh, those that are come to towns to just cause problems and, and to break laws and to riot, Lord, may they receive the full uh, measure of the law. We ask that you would step in and prevent those things from happening so that the true voices of peace that will just want to be heard and be expressed can do so in a peaceful and God-honoring manner. Lord, we're thankful for uh, Tom and the good appraisal that he's had on his house for Tom and Sharon. We ask that you would continue to protect him and his house and his belongings. Be with Greg and Terry as they travel to Lance and give them safe trip, uh, safe travels there and, and on their way back. Be with uh, Dean uh, and um, Dana as they recover from a car accident. May they have complete health and healing and uh, uh, a replacement of their vehicle, Lord, uh, in, in due time. Be with Bonnie, Sharon's sister, as she uh, deals with cancer. Help her as she goes through the treatment and uh, keep her as healthy as possible. Use that treatment to uh, relieve her of that cancer, Lord, according to your good and gracious will. And Lord, we give thanks that uh, Karen Bergeron's daughter, Summer, was protected from accident and injury, along with her uh, granddaughter in the car. Uh, we ask that you would work so that her mode of transportation would be restored and she would turn and look to you as a provider of not only safety, but of all things that are in need. Be with all young mothers who have recently given birth and their babies. We ask that they would have health and healing and that uh, those babies would thrive and that they would be brought under the waters of baptism. Be with our brothers in, uh, in Franklin Mission as they prepare for an opening of uh, the dinner ministry there. We ask that you would make that happen and that things would go without complications. Uh, be with them as they uh, begin the prenatal clinic. Be with them as they plan and execute fam jam and also their efforts to add a laundry mat and showers. We ask that you would bless all these things according to your good and gracious will. And therefore, uh, be with those that are in charge, especially with our, our pastor Christian, our brother, and Christy and uh, their newly born baby, Jules, uh, that you would give them a peace, calmness, and strength and continue to bless them and continue to bless uh, Franklin Avenue Mission. Be with me, Lord, we ask that you would continue the healing on my foot so that I can better resume all of the vocational responsibilities you have given me. And we give thanksgiving enough on behalf of Ron and the good test results that he has received from the doctor. Lord, you are a good and gracious God. And over and over again, even though there's things going on in this world that trouble us over and over again, we see all the blessings that you pour out on us and especially the blessings of faith in Jesus Christ that we all share. May that be renewed and reinvigorated in us as we go through this study. And to all this, all God's people respond. Amen. Amen. We pray the collect of the day. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sin and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Um, Amen. Okay. <coughs> we are in uh, study five, session five, and uh, we started on day one of that session. And we're going to go back and revisit that because that was several weeks ago. And uh, I personally can't even remember what I did last week, let alone two weeks ago. So we'll go back and We'll look at that again. It's Matthew 21, 1 to 11. And as John rightly noted, um, we sang an Advent hymn. But that's an Advent hymn where the reading is what? What do, what do you, does anybody in your, if you're in your uh, Bibles, what is your heading for Matthew 21? A triumphal entry, yeah. Which is what? What is Jesus doing at this point? 
entering Jerusalem on a donkey. Yeah, and what is the day? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. So where are we at in Jesus' ministry? What is just beginning? Holy Week. <laughs> Holy Week. Holy Week which is Jesus' passion is about to begin. So that's where we're at in the ministry, and that's where we're going to be going forward. So uh, we're going to try to uh, put the video on the screen, and then we'll read it from our Bibles. Uh, I'm going to warn you, though, that uh, I was pulling it off Netflix. Netflix doesn't have the Gospel of Matthew anymore, but Amazon Prime does, which I've also remembered. But this is different. It's not the way we usually do things. So I'm not promising you it's going to work per perfectly, but let's see how it goes. Jill and Norma, I don't know if you'll get to see it at home. Uh, I pray that you do. If not, you can just listen along. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. I was going to say, this isn't my what I'm... Yeah, that was like verse 23. Yeah, sorry about that. I warned you, it might not, the, all the trains might not run on time here to begin with. Jesus, the prophet. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Right. Let's read that section of scripture in our own Bibles. Let me volunteer. One through 11. One through 11. Okay. Now when we drew near to Jerusalem, we came to best page to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, 
Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on the colt, the pole of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and took them and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Okay. In our study guide, it has this little commentary beginning. When Jesus, his disciples, and the crowd that followed them arrived at Bethphage, their approach would become visible from Jerusalem. The city was crowded with pilgrims, as many as two or three million who had come to celebrate Passover. Jesus was at the height of his fame, and a dramatic act he offered himself as the people's Messiah. How do you see God's timing out of it here? just from a, a practical demographic kind of standpoint. At the right time for them to get that thing. Which meant what? There was a lot of people. A lot of people. A whole lot of people. Probably more than would be there for any of this was the big festival right here. There were other festivals that people were supposed to show up for, but if you're gonna show up for any of them, it's this one. And there's also other connections there. What did the Jews celebrate on Passover? What happened? The deliverance from Egypt. And in Egypt, they were what? Slaves. Slaves. So delivery <laughs> from slavery. God presented himself in the Old Testament times as a redeemer. <clears throat> so the Passover celebration was joyous. It was reverent. I mean, it wasn't like you sat around and got drunk and danced. But it was, it was not a somber festival. It was a joyous festival. And they would read through the uh, uh, Moses account of the of God freeing them from slavery in Egypt, especially centering around the 10th plague, which was when the angel of death passed over. So with that in mind, Jesus is riding in as what? Well, like we talked about the last time we got, he came in on a donkey rather than on a horse. And I, you the one that, uh, I, I like that. I never thought about that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, what, what, does, a, what does it mean to ride in on a horse? What would he have been saying if he rode in on a horse? Conquering. Conquering who? The Rome. The Rome. Rome. If he was going to go in and kick Rome out, he would come on a horse. A lot of times a white horse. And if you look into Revelation, you will see Jesus on the last day symbolically pictured as returning on a white, white, white horse. horse. Because he's come to claim what really is his kingdom but has been as usurped by the devil, who still, no matter what the devil does, has to do what Jesus says, even though he doesn't want to. Because that's the miraculous and supernatural way our God rules. The forces of evil cannot stand against him. Anyway, so yeah, he's, he's right. And so uh, Al, once again, writing in on a donkey, what was the message there? Humble. He's a humble. Is he still riding in as a king? No. Yes. 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 The, yeah. the donkey is the symbol of peace. So if he, if, if the war had been over, and he was coming to, F, F, you know, battles were often fought outside of the town on plains and stuff. So if the victory had been won, and he wasn't taking over enemy territory, he might. Or if it was long after, he would ride in. But that's not the only reason. Why else is he riding in on a donkey? Uh, to fulfill scripture. To fulfill scripture. So let's look at those scripture passages. Somebody want to read Isaiah 62:11? Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with you. 
and his recompense before him. Who is Zion? Anybody know what Zion stands for? Israel. Israel. Yeah, or Jerusalem. Mount Zion was the city, it was the hill that Jerusalem stood on. So very often poetically, and, and this is poetry in Isaiah, uh, it stands for Jerusalem, but not just Jerusalem, it's the place where God resides. It's where his home was, because in Jerusalem, what do we find? The temple. The temple. Right. And, and even sometimes the temple mount, because that was kind of on a, on a hill, it was raised up. The Temple Mount, where the temple sat, is also referred to as Zion. Right. And so how is salvation coming to them in this fulfillment of Isaiah 62? Right. Jesus is going to bring them salvation. And, and why are they celebrating? Because they believe that he's bringing them Salvation. What kind of salvation do they think that Jesus is bringing? Salvation from Rome. Rome. A very temporal kind of salvation, right? And his reward is with him and his recompense is before him. What reward is Jesus bringing? He's bringing salvation like that last For who? For everybody that believes. For us, right? It's not a reward that we could ever win. He's going to win it and give it to us. And then recompense is not a word that we, we normally use a lot. Uh, it means compensation or reward for loss or harm for suffered wages. Uh, it's also used for people that were won back by worker deeds and warfare. They were recompense. So in that respect, it has to do with uh, people that are won back in war. Uh, what does it mean that Jesus is bringing his recompense with? Who is he winning back and what's the war? War against the devil. Yeah, sin, death, and the devil. That's who he's come to fight. But of course, as we said, the people, they don't see it that way. So, so Jesus is riding in. Does he know the thoughts of the people? Yes. Yeah. yes. Is it really a time to celebrate? No. 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 Yeah, it is. Even though Jesus is going to suffer and die, what he's coming to do, we, they should be celebrating, in fact, even more so than what they are. Mm -hmm. But they're celebrating for the wrong reason. Yet, you know, and I thought about this for a while. Well, Jesus knows their hearts. Why is he allowing all this? Because they're celebrating for the wrong reason. Well, it is a time of celebration. And later on, perhaps there's those that after the resurrection will say, wow, hey, wait a minute. This wasn't Jesus riding in the defeat Rome. This was Jesus writing in as the Messiah of defeat and sent down to the devil. Let's read Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from the sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. In a poetic way, sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth means the whole known world at that time. That's what Zechariah is actually saying. He's come to bring peace to the whole world. So Jesus, by riding in on, uh, on a colt, what is he doing? Well, he's fulfilling scripture, the prophecy. And this prophecy is known to be about the Messiah. This is Messianic prophecy. And so he clearly, and these people know that um, because that's what they're celebrating. They're rejoicing, they're shouting aloud. Uh, they're quoting other sections of scripture. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the Lord, the son of David. They're hip to this, they get it all. They get that he's the Messiah, the son of David, but of course, as we keep saying, he's not the Messiah that they want him to be. And so Jesus is fulfilling scripture. And you think about it, okay, the, the colt, a foal of a donkey, so that's a baby. And, and Matthew is one of the only gospels that has that describes Jesus, there being two animals. He's riding on the younger one and mom is hooked up behind. 
Now this cult, never been ridden. That was part of what Jesus asked him to do. Bring me a cult that never been ridden, right? Is that what you guys would choose? No. Are donkeys known to be amenable to new things and new people? No. no. <laughs> I, I don't think they call them jackass enough. <laughs> So, I mean, part of this is his emphasis on peace. And I, I think we'll, we'll return to that. But what, what is also he's saying by choosing an animal that nobody else would choose to ride? What is Jesus saying? He's humbling himself. Yeah. He's control over nature. Yeah. Not just anybody can get on and ride that animal. Because he is the creator God, he can do that. It's kind of like you ever seen Crocodile Dundee? One of my favorite parts is when he looks at the ox or whatever it is. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's really true with Jesus. I mean, he is at one with all creation, and creation knows that he's the creator and whatever respect of it can understand it. And then out of love, this isn't really said in scripture, but this is how I interpret it. Out of love, mom is with me. Jesus didn't pull that little baby cold away from mom. Mom's tagged on behind her. And she goes along. It's kind of a neat thought, isn't it? Jesus is a loving creator. We, on the other hand, we use and abuse creation for our own intents and purposes without thoughts of what we're doing to creation or about thoughts of what it's going to cost future generations, but not Jesus. So he comes and he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. What's the message here from Zechariah? What is this king coming to do? Save the world. And, and by doing so, do what? Stop the wars. That they peace. peace. Chariots were what you used to fight with. You rode in on chariots. Uh, Israel, for most of their time, didn't really have chariots and, and horses. So that was like tanks nowadays. You know, you're fighting with a gun. Yeah, maybe you have an automatic weapon, but they got tanks. How, how, how firm do you feel about that? An automatic weapon against a tank. <laughs> so, so chariots were uh, a sign of uh, force. Um, battle bow, you know, bows and arrows. They can shoot from a distance further than you can throw stuff. Um, and he shall speak what? Peace to the nations. Now, the people know this prophecy. Are they kind of ignoring this? Oh, yeah. Because if Jesus truly is riding in to defeat Rome, there's not going to be peace right away, is there? No. Somebody, somebody's going to die. <coughs> because Rome's not going to give up easy. They know that this is Passover, so they've got a reinforcement there in Jerusalem. They brought in more troops. Uh, plus, there's troops surrounding in the Palestine area that could come if there were problems, and as we said before, Rome's not going to come in and go, okay, who was revolting? Ron wasn't, Al was. No, they would come in. If we were having a revolt right now, they would kill every one of us and ask questions later. Peace must be established. And after all, we're a conquered people. We're a lesser people. They don't care. They don't care. So they missed this part of the prophecy. And do we do that sometimes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially when our heart desire is involved. Very often uh, when we're mad at somebody, well, they're an unbeliever, Lord. We, I zap them. That guy that just passed me, I want a cop to be there to pull him over. Mm -hmm. Throw him in jail. When uh, you and I sometimes are that guy that's going too fast. <laughs> and maybe even inadvertently, uh, I don't think many of you would do this on purpose, inadvertently cut somebody off. Of course, they don't know that. Comments or questions? So far along? Go back to our study guide. Question two. Read verses six through eight. Somebody want to do that for me? Read me verses six through eight again. Disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus said on them, that a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. 
The spreading of cloaks on the road is what you did if a king came. It was kind of like rolling out the red carpet. You're making the way easy for somebody. Uh, they wove, wove, they waved branches. That was part of a victory celebration. What do we do today? We have uh, uh, Fire tape. fireworks. Tape. What's that? <laughs> Confetti. 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 Normal. I said tick ticker tape. <laughs> yeah, ticker tape. So there's the streamers. And, and then if you're at a football game, they have those big hand things that you can wave, or there's the red towels. There's all kinds of things people wave as part of a victory celebration because you know it, it brings more notice to it than just your hands. Or we all dress the same flags or whatever. So that's kind of what's going on here. It's the way that you uh, show that there was a celebration going on and, and they're doing that. So that's the significance of the cloaks being spread on the road and the use of tree branches. Let's look at these two uh, scripture verses, Second Kings and Revelation 7, 9. Somebody wanna read in 2 Kings 9 through 13? Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps. And they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu. Jehu is king. So this is uh, in the northern kingdom after uh, Israel had split into two parts. And this guy, Jehu, uh, <laughs> he uh, rightly so, sent by God, killed an evil king of the northern kingdom, and they made him a king. And so here you see they're putting down stuff for him to walk on in celebration of him being proclaimed king. And then let's look at Revelation 7, 9. This is uh, John's prophetic look uh, into, uh, this is the last day. This is a symbolic, prophetic, illustrative look at the last day. And what does John see on the last day as people gathered before the risen and uh, resurrected and Christ on the last day? After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Who's the Lamb? Christ. The Christ. So once again, this is a prophetic, illustrative look. It's the last day, and uh, we have the Father on the throne, and we have the Lamb there on the throne. And uh, everybody's clothed in white robes. And, and what does that illustrate about us? That we've been cleansed. Right. And in, in when people used to be baptized babies, they put white robes white on robe. them after the baptism to symbolize the fact that they've been washed in Christ. So these people standing before the throne, who are they? Raise your hand. You're there. This is you. You're standing before the throne waving palm branches in their hands. And what are we celebrating? Christ victory. victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. And that victory we have now, but it's hidden and it's cloaked. On the last day, it explodes and consumes all reality. Anything and everything that stands against the rule of God is gone. Now, will we actually see a throne? I don't know. I think, this, but keep in mind, this is very symbolic. John has seen things that are beyond his ability in, to, to explain in, in words. Kind of, I've used this illustration a lot. If you were uh, pressed to describe the Grand Canyon, you would fall short of metaphors to describe that pretty quickly. It's big. It's huge. How big? Well, you'd have to go, it's like this, only greater. It's like, you remember that place we saw, that great big deep hole? Well, expand that by a million times, and that's what the Grand Canyon is. You have to use that. And so John is using like figures here to try to get us to understand something that, from our situation and point of view, beyond our understanding. Tom, do you have something you want no, to No, I'm just agreeing. Taking it all in. And so really what we have here as Jesus rides into Jerusalem is a foretaste of the feast to come. It's an imperfect celebration. Ours will be a perfect celebration because we will be celebrating the Messiah, the Lamb, for who he truly is. And when he returns on the last day, he will come in a different way than he came this first time. He came very humble, right? 
When he returns on the last day, he will not be humble. You will see him in all his glory as God in human form. And he will ride in, and at that point, all that stands against him will be gone. And those forces of evil and those people that refuse to uh, accept the gift of faith that he brings, they won't have a chance to defend themselves. They will be gone. And we will celebrate. It'll be, as it's been said, the, the best worship service you ever had. <laughs> will it be an hour? What's that? Will it be an hour? No, it won't be an hour. And, he, and, and nobody will be complaining about it. All those complainers will be in the other place. It'll only be half an hour. <laughs> well, you know, actually, it would be timeless. Uh, when, when this earth ends, uh, all the, when we're, we're in a world of time, and eternal life is timeless. So. It's a, time is a created thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Created by God because it's measured by the uh, speed that the earth uh, revolves on its axis. But uh, yeah, and, and that's why one of the things we say is when, when our loved ones die and they go to be with Jesus, they leave behind the world of time. I mean, they're not waiting. They're going, man, I've been here 20 years. <laughs> no. They're, they don't they don't recognize time in the way that we recognize right. time. Good. Uh, let's go back to our study guide. Anybody, anytime you have questions or comments, feel free to speak on up. So let's note the exclamation of the crowd. Uh, why is each part of our exclamation uh, appropriately applied to Jesus. We're supposed to look at Psalm 118 too. Well, somebody read for me again verse 9 while I put Psalm 118 up on the screen. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So how is each part of that uh, what they're saying? How is each part of that appropriate? Again, the Old Testament connection to David and the house and lineage of David. Mm -hmm. So, Hosanna is a, from a Hebrew word which means save us, O Lord. In the original context, it's a plea, it's a cry, a prayerful cry. But here, it's not so much a prayerful cry. They're saying, hey, this is happening. That salvation we prayed about, it's coming. It's here. God has come to save us. And that's appropriate, right? Yeah, yeah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Did Jesus come in the name of the Lord? Yeah. 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 More than that, he is. The Lord. He is the Lord. Uh, uh, and then uh, the son of David, is he the son of David? I go class. Yeah. No, I haven't heard. Yeah, in his humanity, he's the one that's going to do it yet. So I stayed home, but I don't tell us when, when they're done. I don't like to listen to on people's conversations. Um, she should have put it on mute. That's okay. So he is the son of David in his humanity, but in his divinity, he is not only in the name of the Lord, but he is the Lord. So that's appropriate too, right? We have the confession of Jesus' complete identity as true man and true God. Um, and we talked about this last time too, but I, I, I love well, Let's read Psalm 118. Somebody want to read 118, 25, 26? She told me she would give it to him, but... Bless, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Bless you from the house of the Lord. So they are not only uh, referencing as Jesus comes in Zechariah, but they're also referencing Psalm 118, which was also seen as a messianic psalm. Mm -hmm. Save us, we pray. Uh, if you were saying that in Hebrew, you would be saying, Hosanna, or the Hebrew affiliate of that. Right. Jesus is riding in and it's Palm Sunday, but you wouldn't have called it Palm Sunday back then. We only call it Palm Sunday now in the church. Anybody for a bonus feature, what was that day as far as uh, uh, in, in preparation for Passover? Isn't it a day of preparation? Is that it is, yes, part of no. the preparation. Of course, it Lamb Selection Day. Oh. 
Oh, this is the day you selected your lamb. You didn't sacrifice it yet, but you set, you, you picked out your lamb, and your so, lamb had to be what? Oh, there he comes. Sure. God is selecting his lamb. He is, but the lamb is supposed to be perfect, perfect. without mm -hmm. blemish, without fault. And is Jesus that perfect lamb? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, he is. And as one of you, who you say, John, this is God bringing his lamb. Here's my lamb. And after this lamb has been sacrificed, will you need to sacrifice anymore? No. No, it's the final one. They might not send them home. But once again, you look at all these things. Did God have a lot of wheels spinning and a lot going on when he picked this day? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. This was a movie plot. You can see all the loose ends now coming together. And it's that great big aha moment. But they didn't get the aha. No, not, not, <laughs> not that. <laughs> Still didn't they did right. Would we get it? No. Because we can't see the resurrection is what brings the big aha moment, which is why the resurrection, which is appropriate because we're in Easter, that's why it's such a big thing. It brings the aha moment. Without the resurrection, all is in question. We have Jesus' words that is finished, but we can fill that with meaning because of the resurrection. We wouldn't get it either. But as it says in scripture here, I think it's actually in John's account, afterwards the disciples had their aha moment. That's when they sat down and they, Whoa! <laughs> but then some of the people that were in that big celebration parade, they also got it at some point too. Hmm? They also got that big aha moment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wasn't just to the site. No. Keep in mind, I mean, there was a uh, hundred and some that gathered together on the day of Pentecost, and then there was 150 that all saw well, Jesus alive. And, yeah. Not back to ER, no. And then after Pentecost, wasn't there? Huh? There was more than 500 at one time. That, that, yeah. Yep, that's it. That's it. Yeah. And then after Pentecost, well, how many, John? Are gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost. Three thousand were saved. Three thousand were saved and baptized. So yeah. yeah. Turning a page now in our study guide to uh, question A at the top. Hosanna! Literally, save now! A cry to a king to save his people in distress. Son of David, the term for the Messiah. See also Matthew 1, 21. Um, I don't know if I have Matthew 1, 21 or not. So you want to look that up in your Bible? Matthew 1, 21. He will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Okay. So at birth, they named him Jesus. Jesus in uh, Hebrew is Yeshua. And Yeshua means oh, yeah, Yahweh. Like off the his own doing that. Yahweh being the uh, divine name that he was worshipped by. God was worshipped. Because worshiping. he gets so many calls. So from name, this is Yahweh who's come to save. Bam, you know. So it is appropriate that this son of David, who is yeah, the days, would the, the explanation would be, Lord, save us now, will you? Lord's coming. He. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, referring to the one with God's help who uh, defeated the enemy. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. Right, right. Somebody want to read 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. Oh, yeah. death, where is your victory? Oh, I know how oh, this death, where is your feel, you know, and then we're going to have the last one to dying. The power of sin is the law. The thanks be to God, God has the victory for our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so um, what does this tell us about the enemy God, uh, Jesus came to defeat? It's defeated. 
What is it? What is the enemy? Death. 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 But what else? The devil. The sting sin. of death is sin. sin. And the power of sin is the law. the law. So he came to keep the law for us perfectly. So the law no longer condemns us. He came to defeat sin. So the fact that we do disobey the law and deserve punishment. It all fell on him and our punishment is death and will we will die temporarily in this world will we die eternally no no because he that's the victory he's given us and then we're asked to look at hebrews 2 14 to 15. so we want to read that Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So the previous verse talked about him defeating sin, defeating death, and punishment but here we have that he defeated the devil the, the devil. devil how is the devil defeated because man he's still working i see him over in minneapolis i've seen him in portland They're marching on washington dc how is he defeated he can't do anything against god's will he never could in regards to you how has the devil he been defeated in your life he can't take away your salvation which Jesus accomplished on the cross. Um, yeah, yep, that's very true. Um, which one is which one is uh, his name means slander? Is that Satan or the devil? One of them is slander. Is that the devil? I think it's no. Satan. Satan. So what does Satan do in your life? Hey God, did you see what Todd was thinking this morning? Did you hear what he said? He deserves death, God. This guy right here. This guy that proclaims himself to be your follower, he doesn't follow you. Can the devil say that in front of the Lord anymore? No. 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 Jesus steps in and says, hey, he's righteous. He's perfect. I won that perfection for him. And by the way, go to hell. <laughs> You'll be there on the last day. He can no longer accuse you. He has no place before God to accuse you of sin anymore. Well, because he can whisper in your ear a lie he can to say that but you are a sinner really and what do you respond with get well, the hints like the hell with you <laughs> yeah, as luther said can you can you take my savior off the cross satan no you can't then go to hell because he stands as my salvation you cannot accuse me yeah we and, we're, and not only satan but we accuse ourselves I mean, we dredge stuff up from the back and we let guilt come and take over us. And yeah, he's whispering in our ear, but that's part of our sinful heart. But uh, he has no place to do that anymore. And you shouldn't either. Whenever you remember your sins, remember your Savior. And hold fast to the salvation that he provided. Think of the resurrection. Because that's the stamping victory. Satan can't take that away. He can't put Jesus back in the tomb. It stands. Okay. Comments or questions? C. Hosanna in the highest. I'm back in the study guide now. Cry to those in heaven to join in praising the Lord. And we're asked to look at Luke 2, 13 to 14. Somebody want to read that? And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Anybody know the context of this verse? The hint is Luke chapter 2. Angels of visiting the shepherds. Yes, this is the announcement of Jesus' birth. And already the angels are doing what? Proclaiming. Singing glory to God in the highest, praising because they know, well, they may not have the whole story, but they understand what Jesus has come to do for mankind. And so how much more will the angels be rejoicing on the last day with us when the fulfillment is there? How much were the angels rejoicing when Jesus rose from the grave? 
We're also asked to read uh, Philippians 2. We're going to read verses 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that all the name of Jesus, every so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Is Jesus highly exalted now? Well, with Christians. But not the whole world. The whole world doesn't recognize him, but where is his place? At the right hand of God. Right which, which means what? He's exalted. He's worshipped by all the heavenly hosts. What does it mean as far as our temporal future here on earth? Who controls it? Christ. He does. Once again, going to Revelation, which we will study sometime because it's a great book. Uh, there's a, John sees another symbolic vision. There's a scroll. And, and a scroll at that time was from a king or from Caesar, and it was his edict. This is what's going to happen according to the king, right? So this scroll actually is what God has says must happen between the time of Christ's ascension and his return. Here it is. Here's the future of the world. And John talks about crying because there's nobody worthy to open the scroll. Here's the answer to everything, and there's nobody found worthy, except there is one worthy, and John says, he sees a lamb that looks like it's been slain and risen again. And that lamb is? Jesus. He's worthy to open the scroll. And so as this portion of Revelation progresses, you have Jesus, it's sealed with seven seals, which a scroll would be sealed, so only the person that could was worthy could open it and read it. Jesus is popping the seals, and so he is the one that's putting into effect all these things that must happen. He's the one at the right hand of God. Why is there riding allowed in parts of the country? Because of Jesus. He's allowing it for his purpose. God is ruling, just not the way we think he should, which is where we're at as far as sinful human being. Jesus, I, I really think you should end that. This is not how things should be. You should be creating a world where everybody is at peace and we're not warring anymore because, hey, the church could have a great opportunity to preach the gospel. Makes sense, right? But that's not how God sees things. And maybe we can have a little window, a little peek about why this is going on. In times of peace, does the church grow? No. You know, we've had a lot of peace up until this time. And what's happened to the church? Down. Uh, it's an unfortunate fact that in countries where the church is being persecuted and it goes underground, it grows. Because people really get a sense they understand, wow, I can't handle life without God. I can't handle it on my own. So is there a purpose for this unrest and all the bad things that are allowed to happen? Yeah. Revelation kind of describes two purposes of God. For bad things happening. The first one is to call people to faith, to realize that they're, they can't handle things on their own. And those that don't come to faith and their life ends because of that persecution, it's judgment. God is a gracious God, but his grace is not never ending. But those people who die before they come to faith know that God knows their heart. He would never cause somebody to die before they come to faith. No matter what their age is, if they die outside of faith, give them a million years, they would never come to faith. For Christians, the purpose is to bring us back to him. Because we have this tendency to wander. Everything's good. Got my Jesus on the shelf in the glass case. Break in case of problem. Otherwise, just stay there, Jesus. Let me live my life. Keep forgiving my sins. Don't look at what I did yesterday. But keep forgiving my sins. <laughs> So that's the purpose for Christians, is to keep us close to him. And Jesus promises, no matter what happens in your life, he will not let it wash your faith away. He'll use it to keep you close, and he will prevent it from drawing you away. Questions or comments?
Let me go back and see if Norn is still with us. I muted her. No, she's not there. Well, you're muted for now, so we're not listening in on her conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Question four in our study guide. Read verses 10 to 11. Somebody want to read that? And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Jesus' dramatic act has identified him as God's promised Messiah. This was a dramatic act, right? Mm -hmm. As we continue on through our studies here, we're going to see Jesus doing a lot of dramatic stuff, calling attention to him. Why might this be the time, more than any other time before, when Jesus would want to draw attention to himself? Because his time has come to sacrifice and fight for us. Things are coming to a head. Now's the time to pay attention to him. And those that don't come to faith now, as the disciples and others would do later, they would think back on these things that happened because they're ingrained in their memory. I think people are going to remember this dramatic entrance into Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the disciples certainly did, and others certainly did later. Um, others identify him simply as a prophet. So some of them recognize him as the Messiah, some a prophet, which means a man who spoke God's word, but he's not necessarily God, nor is he endowed with anything special. Not the Messiah, not the, not the one promised by David. Which of the following descriptions of Jesus is most meaningful to you personally and why? King of Israel, son of David, God's Messiah, the Lord's anointed, mighty victor, savior, prince of peace, meek and humble, king of the Lord. When you think of uh, king of Israel, why might that have any meaning to us? We're not Israel. Are we? We're the new Israel. Mm -hmm. Because Israel was God's chosen people. Not because they were worthy. They certainly weren't over and over again. Go back to Genesis and uh, Jacob, the founding father of the Israelites, he wasn't worthy. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Judah slept with a woman, got her pregnant, his uh, son's wife. Uh, 11 of them threw the 12th guy into a pit and sold him to slaves. Yeah, they weren't very worthy. And then in Egypt, they weren't worthy either. They had started worshiping the Egyptian gods. Uh, later on, it talks about when Israel left Egypt, they had to be told to put away their gods they took from Egypt. Uh, that's contrary to what the Jews would tell you. The Jews would tell you they were saved, Passover, and they were saved from uh, Egypt because they remained worthy. Bible stands against that. You got to find another story. They never remain worthy. But they don't like the idea of grace. They hate the idea of grace. It's all works. Works are who they are. Well, because they live by law. Mm -hmm. So, King of Israel, if we're Israel, does that have meaning for us that Jesus is our king? king? king. Yeah. What kind of king is he? Powerful. Definitely. Almighty. Definitely. Gracious. What? Gracious. He's a gracious king. How many kings do you know that are gracious? What are kings usually? Me. <laughs> About me. Go get my food. Go get me money. Go wash my car. Quit asking questions. No. <laughs> yeah. How dare you speak back to me, right? Can you speak back to this king? Yes. 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 Yeah, you can. Tom, did you, I, did you have something earlier you wanted to say? Oh, I wanted to. I struggle I struggle with people that don't understand the thing about we're the new Israel. Because there are those that believe that Israel as the nation across the water is mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, and our society in the United States. There are those people that think, oh, we have to protect Israel. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of the fundamentalist churches that believe that? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the Roman Catholic Church? 
No. I don't think the Roman Catholics actually believe that. Like, I don't think so either. I think they, some Roman Catholics might, but I don't think that's like official. They're too busy worshiping Mary. They don't think about that kind of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I have a real problem. Yeah, and you should. Um, there's a lot of fun, the more fundamental churches. Um, it's been said, Jimmy Carter, that was one of the reasons why he did so much for Israel, is because he was the, of that elk. And, and they believe that uh, our country is blessed, that we are who we are with the power that we have because of what we've done for Israel. When, when you are on TV and you're channel surfing, the Christian Broadcast Network has a lot of advertisements to support Israel. Mm -hmm. And we should. Well, I uh, mean, just in a political know, like sending them money for yeah. for poor, the poor people over there because mm -hmm. yeah. Just in a political them. sense, it makes a lot of sense for us to be their allies. Um, we do have a history with them. Um, if, if we establish peace over there, God never told us to stop evangelizing uh, the Jews, so that needs to go on. But the Palestinians need to be evangelized, mm -hmm. as well as the Syrians, as well as Iraq. As well as Iran. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think it's right to support Israel over and above anybody else. However, no, uh, I would rather uh, I would rather see Israel have atomic weapons than a lot of other countries over there. Anyway, <laughs> this is not about politics, but uh, that's a right. very very good point. Yep, we are we are people that can't see that we're Israel don't see the connection of the New Testament with the Old Testament. The Old Testament is kind of in the past, and they miss all the promises that it was all illustrative. That was the church back then, and we are the church now. And Jesus certainly said a lot of things. In other words, you know, I I can't know the have the exact quote, but uh, God can make make a Jew out of a stone. <laughs> it's not about bloodline. Uh, it's it's about the circumcision of the heart. It's not about the circumcision of the flesh, and it just goes on and on. Man was back. Norma, I muted you. So if you want to talk, you'll have to unmute yourself. We didn't want to listen in on your phone conversation. Okay, thank you. That was Dallas. Give us oh. up and he said he was comfortable. He wasn't feeling the pain. And he was, his surgery, he, he said they said it would be like 8.30 tonight. Hmm. Lucky him. He can't, he hasn't had anything to eat. <laughs> so about eight, about maybe 8.30 tonight. Hmm. Okay. You Thanks. let him know that we were thinking of him. And praying for him. And, um, I said a lot of people were praying for him, yeah. Yes. Going back to uh, question four. So we talked about King of Israel. How about the title Son of David? Should that have any meaning for us? Well, because it fulfills God's word. Okay. It would be through David's line. Is that all Jewish stuff? Why does that matter to me? Because he came for everyone, not just Jews. The fact that it fulfills Old Testament scripture, what does that mean for us here in the 21st century? It also fulfills the scripture that all the world would be blessed through him. Yeah, very good. And that this was all part of God's plan from the beginning? Mm -hmm. Yes. From the very beginning, although God didn't spell it out in the Garden of Eden, this is it. God knew what he was going to do even before Adam and Eve fell. And here it is all just being fulfilled. And so what does that mean for what stands yet unfulfilled? Is there going to be a last day? Yes. Yeah. All these other things have come true. Are you going to be standing there by faith? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Are you going to have new bodies like Jesus? Yeah. Yes. Are you going to be gone and separated from sin forever? Yes. Yes. Are you going to have every tear wiped from your eye? Yes. 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 Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Hosanna. <laughs> yeah. That's that's why that's what it means to me. God's fulfilling His plan. No part of Jesus' suffering and death was a mistake. No part of it was the devil or the forces of evil winning. They did their darndest. They wanted to defeat God. And they couldn't do it. Because every mean and terrible and nasty thing they did only worked toward fulfilling 
God's plan of salvation from the beginning. And that should be great, great comfort for us. The evil that you see going on in the world is not evil winning battles against God. It's all fulfilling God's will and plan toward the end. The devil doesn't want to do that. The unbelieving world certainly doesn't want to do that, but it cannot help but fulfill God's will. And so evil that happens in your life only fulfills God's Hello. will for you, even though you can't understand it. Hello. Is that a comfort? Mm, yes. It's something you really have to think on and prayerfully Hello. think about, and which is why we keep returning to the altar and returning to the Lord's Supper and returning to hear the word every Sunday is because we need to be continually fulfilled with that great assurance. Um, so that's Son of David, God's Messiah. For me, kind of along the same idea. Right. He's fulfilling what the, the, the role that God had picked for him. And not only that, but did, did Jesus, what was Jesus' attitudes towards being the Messiah and suffering and dying? A humble servant. All right, God, if I have to, you know, these people are pretty bad. That Pastor Mark just won't shut up. And if I got to die for him, I guess, was that Jesus' attitude? No. no. Yeah, for me it was, but not for you guys. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he was the Messiah. He willingly came. He said, I want to come. I don't want to see humanity lost. The God that says uh, he desires that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, that's Jesus. The one who suffered so much to make it happen, that's him. Tom Jessup. I was going to say, we know that he struggled with it in the garden, but it, he kept going back to the Father. And we have the same struggles because we, we say, you know, if you can take this cup from me, but yet we, we have to accept that these are the things just the same way that Jesus did. Mm -hmm. The reality of it was he had to suffer and die. Well, we have to suffer some of those things we go through. Jesus in the garden, was it, um, if, if lifting that cup from him meant that we wouldn't be saved, was Jesus on board with it? No. No. So lift that cup from me was, if there's any other way that salvation for the entirety of mankind can be done, but it's not, well, I don't really want to do it. Not at all. And it's an honest prayer because the, the weight of the sin of the world, I mean, the oppression physically, emotionally, and spirit, spiritually was falling on him. And it's a, it's a little, we don't get a lot of glimpses inside to the working out of humanity and divinity in Jesus, but here you do. It's the humanity realizing, I mean, he actually felt the weight of oppression. Yeah, he's God, but he's totally human. He felt oppression in the way you and I never will. But he knows how you feel when you feel oppressed and worried and put down. But that, uh, and it's a model prayer for us, not my will, Lord, your will be done. Okay. And then uh, the Lord's anointed. Um, that kind of goes back. He was set aside. Anointing was somebody that was set aside for God's holy purpose. Kings were anointed in the Old Testament. He is the king who's anointed, set aside for this one holy purpose, which is to be the savior of mankind. And then finally, uh, the mighty victor. Well, he certainly is. Because he conquered. Reminds us of what he's done for us. Right. That defeat of our worst enemy, sin, death, and the devil. Other comments or questions on this? Oh, we forgot a couple. Prince of Peace. Those of you that heard uh, Pastor Hensler's uh, sermon last Sunday should be able to add to this. What does it mean that he's the Prince of Peace? Other than that we say peace be with you all the time in worship service, don't we? But it's not the, it's the peace that we find in our hearts to, to be comforted, a comforting peace, not so much like, like a, a contentment. 
Is that is that is that the peace we talk about in worship? That comfort that we have in our heart is that the peace we talk about? Yes. No. The peace with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling that you have. First of all, you you can't produce it. It comes from God, and it's the knowledge that we are no longer enemies of God. Hmm. So it is a peace that's. Passes all understanding. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it, it's a peace that, that we can have in the midst of strife, in the midst of upheaval, in the midst of rioting. Because this is not happening because God is mad at us or punishing us. Quite the opposite. We are his beloved children. We have his promise to protect us. Knowing that we do have an end in this world. So he's not always going to keep our physical bodies alive, is he? But what is he going to make sure? <laughs> that we're not separated from him eternally. That we will die in faith. Yeah, that peace of God that you mentioned that passes all understanding that we hear on Sunday and serve part of the liturgy. Uh, I think of uh, the classic case of the big storm on the Sea of Galilee. And the <laughs> disciples are hanging on for their bare life, right? They're scared. And there's Jesus walking on the water. Calm as can be, the peace of God that passes all understanding, like, hey, you're no problem. Yeah. That's the peace of God. That, that still, very good example. The storm was still going on around him, right? Yeah. right. Waves are still thrashing. And, and how was Jesus? What was his appearance? Hey, it's under control, guys. Ain't no thing. I got this. <laughs> yeah, I got this. Good. And then when, when Peter got out of the boat, yeah, <laughs> he was doing it. Yeah. Until he fought too hard on it. <laughs> until he yeah, until he focused not on the peace that passes all understanding, but how he felt, what he was going through, and what he saw with his eyes. Yeah. Well, he accepted the storm. Part of uh, that was part of Pastor Hensler's message. Is it, it's it's not saying uh, it's not me telling you, okay, Ron. I know you're going through some horrible things. You had a fight with your neighbor, and your wife's hitting you over the head with stuff, but. Uh, <laughs> You're going to be at peace now. No, not necessarily. If that was the case, we'd all have to say that's a lie because as soon as we leave the church, a lot of times on the way home, some Yahoo pulls in front of us, flips us off. We see the neighbor throwing crap on our lawn. We get a call from our kids. They want money again because they did something stupid. That's not my kids. My kids have not. Have not. Not, not Lisa. No. But, you know, you understand it would be a lie. Because as soon as we leave here and we're back out in the world, we don't have that kind of peace. But we do. We have the peace that passes all understanding because not only are we no longer God's enemy, but who's with you? Holy Spirit, who is God, is with you. And he's, a lot of times people will look at somebody and they'll go, how can they just, how can they live through that? Yeah. Tri tri you know, trials and tribulations that they've lived through and just seem like they're okay. And that's because they have the peace yeah. of the Lord. It doesn't mean they don't cry. It doesn't mean they don't worry or fret. But over and above that, there's a presence that comes upon them that dials that all down and that they can turn to. And it's a matter of when you worry and fret, you keep turning that over. You keep turning that over to him and keep turning that over mm -hmm. to him. I think that's what maybe Norma's been doing over the past 24 hours, right, Norma? <laughs> Right. Turn worry over to him. And it's a continual thing. Jill, we haven't heard from you in a while. Got anything on that legal legal pad of paper there? Uh, no, I was kind of behind here. I was working on Proverbs, so sorry. <laughs> oh, sure. Working on Pastor Hensler's Bible study at my expense. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're wise, Jill. You're wise to do that. I'm working on it. <laughs> Get it? Proverbs, yeah. wisdom literature, wise, laugh people, that's a joke. <laughs> uh, the final one, the humble king, meek and humble king, we talked about that, but the final one is the Lord. The Lord. And for me, I wrote Lord, L O R D, capitalized because he is power. He's the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He's the God that saved Israel. He's the God that allowed some horrible things to happen to Judah and Israel. Let the Assyrians conquer them. 
take them away. Babylon come in, take them into exile, all with a purpose. And uh, I remember that because there's the, I've said this before, but what a friend we have in Jesus. He is our friend, but he's more than our friend. <coughs> Al's my friend. And if I cry enough to Al, I might get him to be able to do something that I want that he maybe really doesn't want to do if he's a real good friend, right? Can you do that with Jesus? No. <laughs> On the other hand, when you cry out, you don't have to butter Jesus up. He always hears you when you pray. Well, the thing is, too, with a friend, if you whine to them enough, they might turn away from you because they get sick of listening to it. And Christ can be lost. He's Very always good. there. That's the good thing. You don't have to earn his friendship, do you? No. You kind of have to do that in, in, with each other, don't we? Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of earning. If you treat a friend like crap, they're not going to hang around for very long. So the Lord, I find very, very useful in my mind to remember. Yes, he's my friend. He's my loving Savior, but he is the Lord. The one who said it and it happened. Let there be light. Let there be this. Let there be that. Let there be me. Let this man, Mark, have life. And then, even more so, let him have eternal life through faith. That's all he's doing. Any final comments or thoughts or questions on this part of uh, worship or on this part of our study? I was just thinking when you said about with the Lord, he, he's taking care of our problem before we even go to him with it. He, yeah. he's um, he's already in the process, or he already has figured it, worked it all out for. Us. Yeah, don't we have that kind of a opinion sometimes? Something comes upon us, like with Dallas. Well, I wonder what the Lord's going to do now. He's got to get to work on this. No, he knew what was going to happen. Why do you think Dallas didn't lay out there uh, outside with nobody around to help him? Why the neighbor just had gotten home <laughs> that could help them. by chance, right, Norma? Right. This is the time, Norma. This is the time. He knows. Very good. Well, with that, uh, any other final comments or thoughts? Or... We'll pick it up next week. Jesus is in Jerusalem. And so next week we'll have him cleansing the temple. <laughs> Another example of, of Jesus doing a awe-inspiring work, once again, bringing attention to himself. Here's him doing something very, to draw attention. And also, it's a very unlike Jesus thing, right? Mm -hmm. As a kid, that story, when we got to that, when I was, when we was in grade school, we got that one. Holy smoke, that shook me up. I saw Jesus so angry. So that, that for me, was that was a life-changing yeah. story. Bible story. Isn't that a sin? With the whip and, and, and <laughs> holy smoke, that shook me up. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> that that comes from uh and maybe perhaps we'll talk about this next week, but we like to define Jesus from below. I have my picture of Jesus, and this is how Jesus should like act. A nice friendly person. And so it, and it's kind of the, the sin of the uh of the of the of Judah of Jerusalem here when he wrote in. He's this kind of Messiah, this is where you want him to be. And if he's not acting that kind of as that kind of Messiah, we well, usually should accept it. Yeah. And we all have this picture of Jesus. This is what Jesus should do. And if Jesus isn't acting like we think he should, well, we can't say scripture is wrong, but we'll spin it. Well, it didn't really happen. He wasn't really that vile. He didn't really do this. this no, he did. Let scripture interpret scripture, read it, and accept this is who Jesus is. And this is what it means to be the sinless son of God on earth. This is it. And then you can accept how on the last day, Jesus will send unbelievers to eternal hell. Because he's not the loving, peacenik Jesus with a flower in his hair. It's all cool, man, whatever. That's not Jesus. But he is the one that says, yes, you've sinned mightily, but I've saved you. If your sins are washed away. Come and spend eternity with me. That's all. Awesome. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for being who you are. And more than that, thank you for revealing who you truly are through scripture to us in this study of your word. Help us to continue to draw closer to you and learn who you are as we walk through the events of your Passion Week 
may it open our eyes to what it meant, what you came to do, what you were trying to tell the people of that day and what you're trying to tell us now because it all makes the resurrection that more joyous. That you would suffer so much for us so that the resurrection, your resurrection is our future. Not what we earn or deserve, but what you graciously give us. The gift that you keep alive in us every single day. Walk with us as we leave this place and go out to be your witnesses and thought, word, and action in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Joe. Say bye, Joe. Bye, Joe. Bye, Joe. Bye, Joe. Say bye, bye Norma. Bye. bye. <laughs> See some of you tonight. Brand new Bible study. It'll be hip and happening. Be there, be square. <laughs>